This week, we're joined by Foster from Bears Country Podcast, one of my favorite people to talk to online, and definitely I've talked to Zero off on the phone a little bit as well. And let me tell you guys, one of my favorite quotes is, knowledge plus experience equals wisdom. And there's definitely nobody out there that I know that's more experienced than Foster. Uh, my pleasure to be here, man. You're, you just put a lot of pressure on me. You know, now, now I got to look good, damn it. <laughs> Thanks, guys, for having me. Yeah, um, but let's start it off. How do you guys feel about this last game? I, I, as I go through the game, I, I remember being really excited uh, because the first big thing that happened for the Bears was Brisker blocking that pass, man. He batted the ball from Flacco. And and as the game wore on, I, I was like, wow, we actually – are looking pretty decent. I mean, we still had issues on offense, some spacing, play calling, uh, not catching the ball. So you guys saw the game, man. Those first three quarters looked okay. I mean, we could have done better offensively, but you got to remember Cleveland's the best defense in the NFL. But catching the ball, uh, some spacing on the play calling, and you're gonna you're gonna get into this, but I'm I'm pretty worried about the interior of our offensive line. If we got to go up against, that's a playoff caliber team, man. So it doesn't matter what we do during the season if we don't have the people and the system to to finish to finish the year off. And and what do we all want? Super Bowl. I mean, as an individual game, I um, it was probably one of the more hopeful times I've had in the last like two seasons and uh, I got really excited for the game. And because I think I got so excited, I kind of let some of the excitement and enthusiasm blind me a little bit. And so um, I guess it should, we, we got what we expected a lot of, and Polly like 20 minutes before game time just said, what do we know about this team at the end of the day, more than anything is that they're incredibly inconsistent and nailed it on the head. This is, this was a microcosm game for the whole season. It was, Decent defense, you know, completely lackluster offense in in the most frustrating way where you know that there's talented guys out there just not being used properly and all those things that we've been seeing all season. Um, but it was just very disappointing overall. You know, the Bears actually competed really, really well and arguably should have won that game. So what do I see from it? I think it's a good sign. I think if you uh, zoom out a little bit, right, because we were just so excited. I wanted to see some freaking play. I would. I would love to watch a wild card first round bounce out. I would have killed for that. I'm so sick of, you know, just watching loss after loss. And I got excited for a little bit for a playoff game. But overall, good signs of some things to come because everything is young right now and an experience on this Bears team. So this that was some of the worst ball control, like kill the clock management I've ever seen. And – consistently through the season that is one of the worst areas of this of this team i don't even attribute that to bad defense because part of that is just how much do you want them to do you know dropped touchdowns four interceptions you have a muff punt on the 20 and they bail you out with a diving interception from a rookie so i I wasn't as negative about it i'm mad but overall like zooming out and how the game went honestly it probably was really good There's blame to go all around. There always is. Foster, I really like something you posted on Twitter recently, which was, hey, well, what percentage of the blame falls on fields? And really, that's that's the question people should be asking because, yes, there's always blame. Nobody is perfect. And these guys sit there in, you know, study tape, and they pick themselves apart, probably are way more critical about their own play than we ever are. And, you know, it's funny because any kind of criticism you make fans – some fans cannot take it. They they always have to pick one side or the other, and it's not it's not that because sure there's blame on fields. However, I feel you know if you want to talk percentage wise, no, I think probably the coaching staff did a more wrong. It's complimentary football, right? So if the offense cannot have any kind of ball control and you put your defense in the worst possible situation, then yeah, I mean you're really giving them an uphill battle when it comes to bailing you out in those situations. So it, there is a balance here. Uh, defense got gassed. They got gassed. They were on that field too long. With three weeks being left in the season, the draft positions are starting to become more and more concrete, but also the holes on this team are becoming more evident and more obvious. So David, I'll start with you. I'd like to know, what are your draft position needs? And if you could do them in order, that'd be great. 
in terms of needs, because need is a uh, can be subjective. Even like something Jalen Johnson not re-signing or us not franchises tagging him. But as of right now, in terms of the weakest talent areas on the team, um, you have to go with a veteran interior lineman, and you have to get a young guy too. Because right now that neither guy is on this team, so you have to go and get something there. However, centers and guards notoriously are incredibly attainable like rounds three and later and usually the first and second round guys don't necessarily work out i think even some somebody like uh, uh mike john michael schmitz getting drafted in like the second last year he started off really well and then he got hurt so it's just kind of like a value position uh in terms of early investment you still need an opposite defensive end um really really badly to help fix the team and then you need 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 interior pass rush like not just occasional ones but consistent one um i think that list is getting shorter and shorter which is a great thing because the only place you're drafting is to upgrade a position that's already moderately okay uh because like something like left tackle i think is pretty high up there and that comes from a guy who loves braxton jones i love braxton jones could he be replaced with somebody better for sure and will that make your team a lot better yes but um i think in the trenches is where I usually tend to believe in drafting early. Basically, linemen, offensive linemen, defensive linemen, and probably a corner are the top three positions of need. Center, guard, guard, uh, defensive tackle, edge. So, um, and I, you know, I just, I just kind of threw that on a on a piece of paper when I first saw that because it's it's what I thought of just because of this game. I'll say. It, it all starts in the interior and pulls knows that he's, he was an offensive lineman, you know? So I, I, I look at that. The only problem I have with what, with that issue is he's drafting these guys is, am I going to get a center? That's, that's going to be more effective than what I have right now. Cause what I have right now is not very good between Patrick and Whitehair. I, I, I think it's three, almost I, impossible to downgrade. You're right, right. We and we can't have that. I mean, it's it's mind blowing that it hasn't been like addressed mid season even. So yeah. like that's kind of one of those like in the middle of the season, you know, accountability. One of the things that we talked about is, is like a lot of these moves that they chose to stick to. It takes them a little bit too long to move off of. Yeah. So I just uh, I quickly wanted to just share some of my thoughts on Chase Claypool. Now, uh, listen, I want Chase Claypool to have a good season. I want him to have a career season if he can. Uh, I want the best for the Bears and for this offense. I just, I have a really rough time seeing it happen and, and how it's going to happen. Right, Claypool being like the obvious one. Um, I think the white hair situation and then the Lucas Patrick thing is, is more a move of pride almost. Like you put all this energy and effort into like these veteran dudes who you got from another team and have been here on this team. Like white hair is probably a cut. I think if you get another veteran, Patrick's almost certainly a cut. He's in the last deal. So, like, the two starting guard-center combination for almost every single game this entire season are going to be cuts. Not even trades, but probably cuts in this offseason. But I yeah, think that's one you... of the most critical areas that we need to address. And we do need to address it in the draft. But I don't I don't see these guys being ready next year. we got to make some veteran moves. We, we, we've got to bring in some some veteran help. Nate Davis wasn't wasn't the answer, but we also you know we need another wide receiver because who's our number two? We don't really have one. Period. I'll I'll leave it at that. That needs to be addressed. Yeah, yeah. So I agree with you guys as well. Like interior is huge. I think my top need is defensive tackle. I do feel that left tackle can be an upgrade too. However, I don't know if that makes my top needs. I think center and guard kind of trumps the left tackle for me. And, you know, I do think wide receiver is a position of need as well, but so is defensive end. And so if we're talking about the top of the draft, defensive end, defensive tackle, those are the premier positions you need to draft in the first round based off historical statistics and guys that work out in this league and guys that don't. Whereas positions like wide receiver, I mean, third round Cooper Cup, fifth round Antonio Brown, fifth round Tyree Hill, second round Devontae Adams. We've seen some of the best wide receivers in this league go outside of the first round. I mean, there's way more examples. There's examples of first round wide receivers, too, that are great. Justin Jefferson being one of them. You know, I think it was pick 22, pick 23 or something like that, or maybe a little higher. But um, more 
often than not, you can find guards, you can find centers a little bit later and things like that. Defensive tackles, defensive ends. No, those guys, the ones that are good in this league, those guys are taken pretty higher in the first round. But the, I think the most interesting part of this conversation, I set this up and I was asking you guys this, is because all three of us, none of us said quarterback. However, the talk is, do you take the quarterback at number one? And, and currently, right now, that doesn't even make our list of needs. I've been very clear on how I feel about taking a quarterback early. Um, it almost never works out. And even when they're not the first overall pick, any guy that's taken, you know, first in the draft, even like recent memories, Kenny Pickett in a weak class, you know, it got it does kind of differentiate itself as like an, a, an incredibly risky thing to do. And um, again, if you're talking about value, you're talking about what you can get out of the draft, like, yeah, for sure. We've st- we've gone through this, Paul, and just looked at every decent to above average defensive tackle in the last 10 to 20 years, defensive end. you got to take these guys early. you got to take them off. And then every other position, even at this point, you could argue that the quarterback position, there's almost never the first or second guy taken that's good in the NFL right now. So you have Patrick Mahomes, who was the third guy that draft even, and that's the, the best guy in the league. And uh, Josh Allen was, I think, 17th or 13th pick to Buffalo. Uh, Jalen Hurts was a second, late second round pick, you know, Brock Purdy's number one in every category and he was Mr. Irrelevant. So I think in terms of your value position and where you, who you take and where you take them, I think that hopefully is something that Ryan Poles is not letting the emotion of the situation break his brain from deviating from, because he's been consistent about that. He is an offensive lineman. He knows what offensive linemen are, are, and then he knows what defensive linemen are probably second best because he's played against them. So hopefully this um, this emotional field situation isn't going to you know mess with his head and t- make him do the the typical thing. When I think right now probably the best way to build your team is to be a little bit atypical and just make it deeper and stronger in the trenches. I just hope we don't take a quarterback early. That's my hope. We would maybe be the one team that trades back twice. Marvin Harrison Jr. is is really enticing here as well. You know, you can make the argument for a quarterback, but I think a bigger argument is you got to take Marvin Harrison Jr. However, I just told you, you can find wide receivers everywhere in this draft. Like, is he truly going to be that difference maker at that position? And is he really worth it? And, you know, it's kind of interesting because we talk about the defensive tackle being a need. Well, it was also a need last year. But what did Ryan Poles do? He did not take Jalen Carter. He actually traded back one more spot, and he did not address the interior of the line. He even addressed the exterior with the right tackle because he felt that that was probably a better player at that position. Listen, there might have been a chance that Jalen Carter would not have survived this roller coaster. <laughs> I mean, it, it does take some mentally tough. I know all three of us have PTSD and have been scarred by this team. So are the players. Like, you got to be mentally tough to sit here and go through what they're going through. I mean, we feel it as fans that they're out there doing it. I remember a quote from Ryan Post saying, hey, we can't afford to take risks on character issues because our locker room just isn't there yet. Well, I think I think this team has showed you that they've actually stuck together through the crap, and I think moving forward, that's a different story. I think you might have a stronger locker room now, and maybe this year you can afford to maybe take a shot on some someone out there, even if they have character concerns. If you feel that the window on this team may be starting to creak open because the defense is playing really good, then why would you sit there and try and gamble on the most impactful position when you're all you're trying to do is develop some type of consistency. I've been very clear on how I feel about taking a quarterback early. Um, it almost never works out. And even when they're not the first overall pick, any guy that's taken, you know, first in the draft, even like recent memories, Kenny Pickett in a weak class, you know, it got, it does kind of differentiate itself as like an, an incredibly risky thing to do. And um, again, if you're talking about value, you're talking about, what you can get out of the draft, like, yeah, for sure. We've st- we've gone through this, Paul, and just looked at every decent to above average defensive tackle in the last 10 to 20 years, defensive end. you got to take these guys early. you got to take them off. And then every other position, even at this point, you could argue that the quarterback position, there's almost never the first or second guy taken that's good in the NFL right now. In terms of your value position and where you, who you take and where you take them, I think that hopefully is something that Ryan Poles is not letting the emotion of the situation 
break his brain from deviating from because he's been consistent about that. He is an offensive lineman. He knows what offensive linemen are, are, and then he knows what defensive linemen are probably second best because he's played against them. So hopefully this um, this emotional field situation isn't going to you know mess with his head and t- make him do the the typical thing when I think right now probably the best way to build your team is to be a little bit atypical and just make it deeper and stronger in the trenches. In the draft, I think I would try and trade back that first. I know I'm going to trade the first pick back because there's no sense in, in setting us back years with drafting a quarterback in the first position. But I, I think I would go for a wide receiver and then I'd try and get like Jared Verse or Chop Robinson because I ought to be able to trade back, like you said, twice and do that and pick up a second round pick to use on it and start start building that interior offensive line again. But then if I'm polls, when somebody comes to me for this first pick, I'm going to ask you guys, you guys are general managers of the team. So what are you going to give me for Caleb Williams or Drake May or Marvison Harrison Jr. or Justin Fields? What are you going to give me? Well, oh, I think what you're willing to pay and what you get out of that payment is a really important part of that question, right? Is because yeah. What every team is willing to pay right now, if you go back to the Patrick Mahomes draft, he was taken seventh, I think. From the first time he played it against the Bears where he scored a touchdown, and then he went because he was taken 10th overall. Yeah, Everybody would have traded up to one overall and traded their next five first overall picks for, right, like probably Patrick Mahomes when you know what you're dealing with. And right now it's it's an assumption game because – you thought you were getting something with Mitch Trubisky. You thought you were getting something with Deshaun Watson and even Deshaun Watson, a guy who pays off. Like a lot of these guys aren't panning out because they're hurt. Trevor Lawrence has the same statistics through 41 games as Daniel Jones. So what you're willing to pay is, is everything. So like if Caleb Williams was guaranteed to be Patrick Mahomes, and that's one of the most ridiculous comparisons. It's like, like, this is Kobe Bryant. This is Michael Jordan. Like, who drafts a guy thinking that you're going to get that? That's insane. Even if Caleb Williams, like, lives up to, like, 100% of his potential, if you have a guy that's 80% of Patrick Mahomes, like, you're still stoked on that pick. It it matters about how in love with the guy you are versus the guy you already have, where your team is and, what like, where they're at as a team and where you're in your building stage. And so what you're willing to pay – is pretty much everything. If you're asking me to answer that directly, Foster, like like literally, this year, you're probably getting three first-round picks to start talking in that conversation. The, one of the interesting comments I got on my videos, it made me actually look up some statistics. One guy said, hey, how many sacks did Tyson Bajan have when he was in there? And I was like, oh, like that that's a really good point. So I started looking it up. Okay, so in four and a half games, he got sacked five times. Well, you know what? Fields only has had one game where he got sacked two times. He has five games where he got sacked three times, three games where he got sacked four times, and one game where he got sacked six times. Like I said, man, any criticism you throw at the guy, people just like turn on you with pitchforks and everything. I don't even really care. But um, what am I? One of the criticisms that we have to consider here is the guy behind him is an undrafted rookie free agent. And when he went in there, that offensive game plan didn't drop off that much. It should have. You got to go back. I had to go back and look at the entire game plan. It was it was it was a different game plan. It wasn't the same game plan that they ran for Justin Fields, man. So, yeah, Fields is rushing instead of the running backs rushing. When Tyson Bajan's in there, they're letting the running backs get their touches. And that's that's what gives them the opportunity to get that game. We've seen it all the time, like 10 touches, 20 yards, but then it's 15 touches, 70 yards. So you, those guys need their opportunities too, and I feel the game plan with Fields takes away, not adds to. I don't like the design runs for Fields, man. Unless it's fourth and one and we know we're going to get it, or you know, not even that. I mean – the only time I want to really want to see him running is when the, a play's broken down, everybody's covered, and there's a gap. So he can slide, so he can get his eight or 10 yards and slide or break one for a touchdown. At this point, the three best scrambling quarterbacks in the league, in terms of everything, statistics and all, are guys that almost never use it by design. Maybe we're talking two to five of those a game where they're actually running the ball. Jalen Hurts averages 12 a game because he has six tush pushes in there, right? Like, it just doesn't count. 
Josh Allen mostly does it off of scramble drills. Occasionally, like on fourth or third and short, they'll go like five wide and just let him hit somebody hard and gain a yard. And then Lamar Jackson at this point, say what you want about the guy, he's evolved to like a legitimate, legitimate passer that's just fast and sneaky as hell. It's never going to work when it's the main design. Okay, Lamar's the leading success- rusher through first quarter in, in one of these oh, games. What, what the hell is that? The most successful rushing quarterback we've seen in the recent history of the NFL, whether we like it or not, has been Russell Wilson. And he was too small to have runs designed for him. He actually needed to, to, to rush with safety in mind he's always sliding he's always going out of bounds that's why he's been able to survive as a rushing quarterback but that that should be the model for success